What's up, everybody? It's Ocean Talk Friday. Andrew Lewin here, your host from Speak Up for Blue podcast. I just want to say thank you for joining us. I uh, love the fact that you are joining us uh, each and every episode. Uh, we're getting a lot of new listeners on. So if, you, if you're a new listener, this is where we talk about marine science and conservation. Uh, it's a platform. We talk about the, within the industry, which we're going to talk about today. And we talk about news and updates that are happening around the world to keep you aware of what's going on. We've got a lot of great things to come. Um, originally, actually, this podcast i was going to do uh a different something different um i was going to do a whole episode on science communication and i think i'm going to wait on that to make it a little bit more in depth uh because when i was uh when i was reading sort of just my updates i found a, a great article in manga bay news and it's all about conservation jobs and conservation careers and i think it's really important as someone who helps people uh, in their marine science and conservation career. Uh, I, I do some consulting. I've, I had a course out at one point uh, to help people break into marine science and conservation because I had a tough time. Uh, there's an article that talks about a lot of the things that I talk about, and I had some, some extra points to add on to that and some responses on, on that article to add on to that. And so I think it's, it's, it's important for us to do that, especially people going into the new year. It could be their last year of university where they're about to graduate from their graduate degree. Uh, it's important for them to know what's ahead and how they should prepare. So we're going to talk about that today uh, on Ocean Talk Friday. And of course, this is the beginning of a con- uh, conversation. And uh, last the beginning of this week on Monday was great in the Speak Up for Blue podcast community Facebook group, which I love. Uh, they, there's a big conversation going on about meat eating, which I covered in, uh, on, on Monday about my position on, on, on meat eating and climate change and so forth. So, uh, this I think is going to also garner a lot of conversation with, uh, when we talk about careers, this is, uh, it, it's a difficult thing. It's not an easy thing to do, especially in the marine science and conservation world. It's very niched, uh, and we need to really, uh, focus in on what we need to do to get there, to, to better our chances. So that's what I'm hoping to do today. Uh, but go to speakupforblue.com forward slash group to get involved in the Facebook group. Uh, we got over 250 people now there. It's growing like crazy. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's let's get into it. So go to speakupforblue.com forward slash group. Use your Facebook group or your Facebook account to requ- request to get into the group. I'll let you in. Talk about marine science conservation careers. Uh, we talk about anything, really, anything related to marine science and conservation. But today we're going to be talking about careers, and I'll be posting a couple things on the job boards, or on the job boards, on on a, our Facebook board and say, hey, you know, uh, this is what we're going to talk about today. What are your responses? And I think we'll get a good response on that. So uh, let's start the show. If you are sick of hearing of the doom and gloom of the ocean and not knowing what to do, you're in the right place. If you want to meet people working to protect the ocean, then you are in the right place. If you want to find out how you can get involved in protecting the ocean, then you are in the right place. This is the Speak Up for Blue podcast, and I am here to empower you to live for a better ocean. Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Speak Up for Blue podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin, founder of speakupforblue.com, marine ecologist, and self-proclaimed oceanpreneur. And speaking of oceanpreneur and careers and career paths, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I had a, uh, a show lined up to talk about environmental science careers because Monday, Tuesday of this week, I, not Monday, sorry, environmental science communication, not careers, uh, on Monday and Tuesday, I was at Duke University uh, at a retreat for a program where I'm developing a course on how to podcast for environmental science. There's a lot of other instructors as part of Duke's environmental education program. Uh, they've asked me to develop a course uh, to help their students and their their people who, it's a lot of times it's people who already have a career and they're looking for professional development help. So this is an environmental certificate. Um, and a lot of people from their graduate program take these courses to help them out. A lot of people who are already in careers just kind of look around and say, oh, this is new, I want to I try this, or how do I get into this without struggling as much as I need to? Um, so I was there, and it was great. I, I enjoyed it. Duke, it was the first time at Duke. It was fantastic. It was a beautiful university, uh, and thanks to our, my hosts uh, for, for, 
for taking me around and, and whatnot around Durham, North Carolina, where Duke is situated, as well as the uh, Duke campus. So that was a, a lot of fun and, and meeting all the, the people that I'll have on the show because I think they have a lot of value to really uh, help us focus on, on science and conservation communication as people who are listening to this episode and want to help other people understand what's going on um, and, and we want to change our behaviors. And there's a great uh, couple of courses on behavior change and social marketing by, um, uh, by, by an instructor there. And it's just, we're going we're gonna to go through it over time. But that's the show I had planned for today to talk about that. But I read this article that, and, 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 and to be honest, I listened to, sorry, before I go into that, I listened to this podcast the other day by a good friend of mine, uh, Doug Parsons, who hosts America Adapts, the climate change podcast. We've had him on the show before, and he's been great. And he's done a wonderful job and a consistent job, uh, which is important in this in, in podcasting, to uh, bring to light climate change issues and how to adapt to climate change, uh, going beyond the debate of climate change and, and moving into that. But he did a really, really great episode. I mean, all his episodes are great, but this one... I have to give my hats off to him. I was impressed because he brought on a climate skeptic called, uh, his name is Mark Moreno, who's been around for a long time and is highly respected within the whole skepticism, uh, climate change denier, or not necessarily climate, he's climate change skeptic, not denier. There's a, there's a difference. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll understand what it is. Uh, you know, this is a, an interesting way of going about it. Uh, Doug had him on, this guy's controversial, you know, this guy is, is spewing out a very different narrative than what we are looking at, than the, what, you know, we're, we're talking about. A lot of scientists, a lot of conservationists are just like, there's no debate, this is climate change, you gotta, you gotta just do it, like, you, you know, you just gotta adapt to it, and, and we just gotta deal with that. Um, but he has, not only did he have on Mark Reno, but what he did is, he had on Randy Olson, who's a friend of Mark Reno's, and Randy Olson is sort of like your science communicator. I wouldn't say God, but he's 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 written he's written books on it, let's just say. Uh and and really respected books and I I I got his book Don't Be Such a Scientist, but he also wrote, wrote a book Houston We Have a Narrative and he really he has him on Doug has him on the podcast to talk about other things. And I'm going to go through that another time cuz I'm I'm digressing, but listen to the podcast. Go to America Adapts, the Climate Change Podcast. Mark Marano's on it, and Doug asks him a number of questions about skepticism, and then he has Randy Olson on the program to deconstruct what Mark Marano said and really talk about how the, the climate change movement is ignoring an important fact in skepticism that we really need to address instead of just sort of, of putting them to the side. They're not going anywhere. And they're providing a big fight right now. And we need to do better. And we need to engage with them. We need to start changing their minds in a way. But we really need to start doing that. And he starts talking about building personalities. And that's where the communication comes from. So we're going to get into that another time. I want you guys to go America Adapts, the Climate Change Podcast. I'm going to put um, the link in the show notes so you can go easily to, to look at that. But it's a great podcast. Subscribe to it. Um, I think you sh you'll have a good time doing it. Anyway. I spent too much time talking about that. Let's talk about careers. There's a great article. Uh, if you don't know about Manga Bang News, uh, you are missing out because this is a, a great environmental um, website, magazine, news site. And they, they have great authors. Uh, it's it's a uh, nonprofit organization, but it just it keeps turning out great work. And this article, a rich person's, it's a, it asks a question, a rich, rich person's profession, young conservationists struggle to make it. And it's by Jeremy Hans. I was, it was, uh, I think it was, it was on the 16th, it was published on the 16th, so it was published on Wednesday. And I saw this right as I was about to do the communication uh, podcast. And this is an article, it's a great article, and it talks about a lot of the struggles that young graduates and young people are going through in a very different world today that we see as conservation. Now, this article is, is focusing on conservation in general. And it, it, it really, it, it looks at it, it, it interviews a number, it interviewed a number of students from seems, what seems to be all over the world. Uh, it talks, and, and then it talks to um, 
uh, it talks to what you would call it uh, Con- uh, conservation careers founder Nick Askew, uh, which I've uh, who I've known for years, uh, and he's done some great work on his website. So you know, it just it it dives into the struggles that people are having, and is talking about how people are having to do other careers like working at Starbucks or waitressing or um, just struggling in general to find a permanent job that pays a salary. Not even just a salary that's above the pot or poverty line. People are having trouble getting a pay a job with a paid salary. And they really go into a lot of um, unpaid internships, uh, traveling to those unpaid internships, or even paying to get experience. And what I really got out of this, I mean, I... I my advice in here, now I should I should go back a little bit. I've been providing people with advice and consulting with people for the last five years on how to build a conservation career. When I started my career back in 2001, I graduated with my undergrad degree. I was gung-ho set on getting a job. I was very fortunate to get a, a contract job with a local conservation authority which is like a municipal style conserva- uh, conservation organization, nonprofit. It was a contract work for, I think it was the summer. So it was basically from June after I graduated until the end of September, where I worked with uh, you know, on a team where we went into different streams in the Toronto area and essentially assessed the stream based on benthic invertebrates and all that kind of stuff. Uh, great job, great experience. After that job, though, I went six months without finding a job okay i was a marine biologist in ontario ready to work i was i was ready i was excited i was ready to start my career make some money start building my life it was hard within that six months i did two things one i sent out 400 resumes i'll talk about that in a minute the second thing i did is i got a job I got a job at a local aquarium store. Not aquarium, public aquarium. We didn't have that. A local aquarium store. Getting paid minimum wage and just working and living with my parents after university. Now, I was very fortunate that I didn't have any student debt. Uh, so that was, that was a great thing. I didn't have to worry about paying off student debt. I was able to live at home. Now, again, I'm in Ontario, so it's hard to find a coastal job that's in the marine realm but I was living in Ontario. I was financially, I was stable enough where I couldn't move out on my own. But I had the chance to live with my parents uh, at the time and uh, and have a, a job, you know, and just earn some money. I had a girlfriend as well, who's now my wife. Uh, but it's, but going back to the six month, four hundred resumes, I uh, I was like, like I said, I was gung ho. I was right, and I applied to everything, everything. I applied to jobs that required PhDs. I applied to, and I didn't have it. I applied to jobs that required master's degrees. I didn't have it. I applied to jobs that required, you know, three to four years of experience. I didn't have it. I just graduated. I applied to jobs where you need 10 years experience in executive director and like management experience. I didn't have that, but I applied to it. And... At the end of the six months, I, fu- I got a job. And I had a system. I would apply to, an, uh, uh, I would apply to a, 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 uh, an organization or an employer of job ad, basically. And I would put it down on my spreadsheet that I applied. And then in two weeks, I needed to call. Now, this is the beginning of, of internet. There weren't as many people, I would say, applying over the internet. And calling was still okay. Unless it said, do not call, I wouldn't call. But then I would call back in two weeks to find out how they were progressing on the interview. Or on, the, on, the, on, getting, it, on getting people in for interviews. And I wouldn't get a lot of calls back or I'd get passed on. Or they said, we haven't, you know, we haven't looked at them yet and so forth. Finally, at the end of the six months, I made a call. Actually, it was late, a week late. I forgot to call. I was getting, and it, yeah, I, I, at the end of the six months, I got a job. I made a call and I got lucky. The person that was on the other line was the operations manager. And when I called, they said, oh, yeah, well, we just had two people, two of our technicians quit. It was for a marine technician position on a boat. And they said, let's interview. So I had an interview right on the spot of calling. 
And then two hours later at my job that I was working at the aquarium store, I had another interview with somebody different within that organization. And at that point, I got hired. And within a week, I was down in Louisiana on the Gulf of Mexico doing research. Not research on my own, but I was working with other researchers as a marine technician. Now, I got lucky. It was right place, right time. And that can happen. But I feel like it's more like a lottery. And you shouldn't rely on that. And, uh, and I, I, I figured it could be easier. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. I was just applying to jobs where I saw that I could do it. Because I was like, I could do this job. I can do it. And then over time, I, after that job, I, I did my master's. I wanted to go back to do graduate do, uh, graduate degree. At one point, I wanted to do my PhD. I never did because I chose uh, sort of lifestyle and family over uh, a poverty-stricken graduate student. And so I went back. Uh, I came back to Ontario, and I started working in private consulting. I got a job with the government on and off with contract, and then through a recruiter, I got a job in private consulting which I didn't really like that much. But I did it for like six years with two different companies. And and it was really, I did it because there was nothing else. I was applying to government jobs I couldn't get. I was applying to other jobs I couldn't get. I wasn't getting even a response to my application. So I wasn't even getting the interview. And that took a while. And it was frustrating. And when you go through, if you haven't gone through a job searching experience, and career building experience, it is extremely frustrating. Especially if you don't know what you want to do. If you don't have a a very good idea of what you want to do. And I'm not talking about just, I want to do marine conservation. If you don't have a focus on the type of job and the type of career that you want, it's going to be extremely frustrating. And I'll tell you why in a second. But so going through that process, I was like, oh man, this isn't going to work. So it was only until... I was doing a, um, I got laid off of my consulting gig and I was like, uh-oh. So I started doing consulting on my own. I've always been an entrepreneur. And then, you know, eventually I had to find a job. So during that time, I was still finding a job consulting every once in a while. And that's where Speaker for Blue came up, by the way. But it was during spare time of looking between consulting jobs and actual full-time jobs. But uh, it wasn't until I was doing a uh, a temporary position like a contract position with the government of Canada and I met a friend who said who basically like I looked at the a job application she said you'd be great for this and I said yeah but I've applied to so many government jobs I'm just getting frustrated I'm just not going to apply and she was like you can't do that she's like I will teach you how to apply because there is a system that you need to put in place to teach and that will teach you how to apply for a government job and that we worked for her, it worked for a lot of her friends, and she had it done, like taught to her when she got her job at the government. So I said, let's do it. So she taught me, and I mind was blown. My mind was completely blown out of this world. I got the job because of her help. I, co- I qualified for the position, no doubt about it. And I knew that, but I also thought I qualified for every other position. Just because based on because I can do it, but I actually had the skills to do this position. I got the position, and it was a rigorous interview interview process. I was interviewed twice. I had to do uh, an exam. It wasn't easy, but I did it. I knew the materials, which helped, but I did it. And after that, I said, you know, I was talking to my friend. I said, not a lot of people know about this about this way of applying. It, it's And I felt like it was up to me to help people on how to apply for a position in conservation or in science or in marine science conservation. And that's where Speak Up for Blue started to build a career advice sort of arm to it. And I've always been doing it. Uh, I came up with a course and not a lot of people bought. I don't think they really trust it because a lot of people, when you talk to them when they graduate, they think, I'll just graduate with an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree, and I should be able to get a job. And then they get a reality check. They have student debt. They have to get another job to make ends meet. And now, and, I'm, and, and this is not necessarily their fault. This is just the life that they have, right? And, uh, and, it's, and like I said, it's a very emotional process. When you get rejected constantly, 
It's almost like when actors talk about being rejected, 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 and finally getting the job 10 years later, only because they persisted through it. That's how they got their job. But they went through a lot of struggle before that. But I don't feel like you need to go through that struggle, right? I feel that for a lot of people, if you have a clear direction of what your career path is going to be, and that takes time to research and figure out, it helps. Because instead of applying for 20 jobs a year, you end up applying for three to four. But you become highly qualified for that position. Because you start building up the skill set that you need for that type of career path. And that's what I always tell people. It's Because they'll, what they'll do is they'll come to me and like, I want to protect sharks. Well, that's great. How? Name me a job that you can work in or that you want to work in 15 years from now. And they can't. Because they don't know, because they haven't researched the position. They just want to protect sharks. They've seen it on shark water, they've seen it on TV, and they've seen you know, the studies and stuff, and that's great. But that's just one part of it. You need to really figure out and dive down and niche down into what you want to do. And yes, it kind of narrows in your focus, but then you apply to three or four jobs, but your applications are so on point and they're so detailed that it works. You know, one of the major things in this article that they talk about is the unpaid internships and the fact that a lot of people, when they graduate, they don't have a lot of experience. And that's true. If you graduate undergrad, you are not necessarily considered to have a lot of experience. Unless you do internships and volunteering during your undergrad. Unless you do extra things to give you experience during your graduate degree. Now, a lot of times when I speak to people, their biggest sort of, like, and they're, they're struggling, they have debt, they have problems finding jobs, they can't find jobs, it's been one, two years, six months, whatever, and they're getting, pay, they're getting impatient, they're getting frustrated, and I, can, I don't blame them. However, they don't have a clear path of what they want to do. They don't know the skills it takes to get those and they haven't gone for them because they don't know what they are and they don't know how to apply to a job I look at these resumes and and as someone who's hired people before I look at the resume and I'm just like I don't know what you I don't know what you offer compared to what the job advertisement is telling me it's a template resume it's not customized for the position the cover letter is only one page and it shouldn't be the cover letter should detail what, do you, what experiences you have and how they qualify for the qualifications that are listed. And they don't do it. So yes, conservation, the industry, is lacking in funding. There's a lot of unpaid work out there. And people demand that you have three to five years experience when you come out. And that doesn't always happen. But on a lot of cases, it's a matter of, you know what your it's a matter of career building and getting into that career building mindset when you come out of school and it should be as you're in school to figure that out it will help you i'm not saying it'll guarantee you a job but it will help you in an industry that is very difficult to get into it is a struggle we've all been through it but to lessen your struggle have a focus on what you want to do and have this persistence that no you cannot tell me i'm going to do something else but also put in the work to get the experience and the skills you need to get into that. And there's ways you can do that. In your undergraduate degree, you can volunteer. You can volunteer within your university with professors and labs, and you can get great experience out of that. You can volunteer, like I volunteered, at a, like when I, volu- when I was in my undergrad, I volunteered my last year, which was too late. I feel I was we have an aqua lab which was basically like a, an area where we housed animals for experimentation and stuff not bad experimentation but like ecology work and whatnot and and aquaculture work and I was there as sort of like the husbandry person as a volunteer and I got it got me some experience it got me an interview to to a job but it wasn't enough I should have started in first year sought out a professor asked to volunteer, build up my experience, and build up my knowledge of what the industry looks like. 
when you start speaking to people who are graduate students as well as professors, you get a little bit of an idea of what the industry is looking like, at least in academia, right? So I feel it's important that, you know, it is, it's easy to complain about the struggle because it is a struggle and it's frustrating and it's demoralizing and it can be humiliating at times because you're constantly getting rejected. But I'm going to tell you from experience, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, tunnel if you persist and you put in the work. And you have, you have to be understanding that you may not be the best person for the job. There are other people out there that could be better than you. But what are you doing to better that? What are you, and I'm not, I'm not blaming people, right? What I'm trying to do is motivate people to say, I'm going to do everything on my part to do better. That means look at the way I'm getting experience. Especially if you're a, gra if you're a graduate student or you're a student right now, really look at how you can better your skill set. There are a lot of advantages you can take while you're a student. For one, GIS uh, software, geographic information software, which is used in a lot of science, I would say in every piece of science, is extremely cheap to learn in school. Not just taking classes, but just having access to the software, you can buy a student version of the software for like 50 bucks or something like that. That's what it used to be. Normally it goes for like a very basic license, it goes for 2,500 bucks, Canadian. So look at that. Look into building extra skill sets that will make you different from everybody else. And what can you bring to the table? You know, there was, there was somebody that, I knew, I'm not going to name her by name, but there was somebody that I knew, a friend of mine, who came to me and asked me for help. She was applying for a fellowship. And she had just graduated from her PhD. But one of the things I knew why she was going to get this fellowship, I had a feeling she was going to get this fellowship. Not many people get it. She came to me and asked, like, what do I need to do? I said, well, you're ex in terms of experience, you don't need any more. You've got experience. Now, and what I mean by experience is, not only was she a PhD student, she would take students, she would teach almost full time. Uh, she would mark papers and all, everything like that. She helped. Um, she helped organize a the student events at one of the, some of the largest uh, conservation conferences in the world. Well, not in the world, but some of the like big student events during these conferences. Um, and then she would teach in Belize once a year. Students, she would take students down and teach them on one of those getaway kind of things. And then she did her PhD. And I'm going to say this, a PhD is a full time and a half job. And she was doing all that. Now she was exhausted. She would complain about how hard she was working, and I don't blame her because holy cow, but she did it. And when she applied for this fellowship, I just had to tweak, a like offer some little advice that showed her passion for the job on her sort of her statement. She had to like a personal statement she had to make. She got the fellowship. And then from that fellowship, she got a job. But it's because she put in so much work before that. Not just on her PhD. But she did other things. There was another woman that I helped. She came to me when I was offering advice. She bought my course. And we had a one-on-one -on -one interview. And I asked her, you know, what she was doing. And she had a couple of jobs, but she didn't like it. She wanted to go into marine conservation. Now, she was more involved in, like, the GIS aspect, hydrographer aspect. I looked at her resume. And I said, you have great experience. And I think, and all I said was, let's just structure it a different way, and let's talk about your cover letter, because I always ask, you know, give me the last application you sent, and a job, the job ad if you can. And she did, and and we just tweaked her information a little bit, and you know, solidified her cover letter by adding like the description, telling her what description to add, or like the type of description in her own words. She called me or emailed me. I think it was three or four months later, and said so that she got she was in the states, the southern states, and she said she got a job in Australia for CSIRO, which is like their government organization, 
doing bathymetry on their boat and traveled around Australia on a boat. Said she was excited. Now she's doing a PhD at the University of Tasmania in marine conservation. So sometimes, if you have the experience, it requires a little bit of tweaking to get a, a paid job. These are all paid jobs. Other times, it requires you building experience. Right? And when you get into the unpaid internships, yes, it is a flaw in our industry. It is a flaw. It sucks. It does suck. But if you prepare yourself and you do the do volunteer work throughout your, your, your student life, your student career, it will help because you can do it locally. You don't have to pay to go away to do something. But you can also get involved in, in conferences. Getting involved in conferences is the biggest network builder you've ever seen. And people love the work you do, right? Because if you get involved in conferences, it's unpaid work, but it's, it's conference work. You're helping organizing a conference. But other players who are organizing the conference are really helpful. You know, like they see how helpful you are if you do a good job. And then they, they'll start recommending you to places or introducing you to people. And you build your network that way. Right, so you can volunteer doing that. The other thing is, I had a friend recently who got a job at a prestige NGO. And the, one of the reasons why he got the job, and I was told this by the employer because I was one of the references for that person, was because he was doing something else other than the job he was working at currently. He volunteered to do ocean conservation awareness. And that dedication, that passion, showed the employer that he is all in on, on these types of jobs and on marine science and conservation. So build up your profile online. Show that you are dedicated. Start a podcast. Start a YouTube channel. Those aren't expensive to do. It requires consistency and hard work. But while you're building your career or maybe you're a student, Start a podcast. Start a YouTube channel. Doesn't have to be brilliant. It doesn't have to be Discovery Channel type quality. Just start something. Show that you love this work. Show your passion. Because if you're different from everybody else, people are going to like that. You'll stand out from the crowd. But what I want to do for now is let you know that I just still do offer uh, consulting because I think it's important. Now, I do charge an hourly rate, um, and I do that because it takes up time. And I used to offer them for free, but what I was noticing is people would, would, um, uh, would make an appointment and then say they would show up, and then they wouldn't show up. And sometimes I'd stay up to like 12.30 in the morning uh, waiting for people, and they wouldn't show up. So I do charge a rate. Uh, it's it's fifty dollars per hour. It's very cheap. And if you want to get in touch with me to find out more about your career, you can do so. Just email me Andrew at speakupforblue.com. I will arrange something for you uh, at your uh, with your like with a bit of flexibility uh, at your leisure, and we will uh, go ahead and do it. So it is payment up front, but I promise you, I offer a lot of value. I can't guarantee you that you can get a job, but I can help you put you on your way. So uh, go to just email me, Andrew, at speakupforblue.com. I'll help you as much as I can um, because I, I'm passionate about this. I, you know, I was, when I was in Duke, I was actually talking to their career center. They actually have a career center for their environment school, you know, and, and I think that, which I think is really helpful. I think every school should have. Um, it costs a lot of money to put in a school, uh, a, a career development center like that and have a lot of experts in that, but I think it's really important. Um, not a lot, every school has that, so that's why I'm here to offer you uh, any kind of a, a help that you can if you're struggling to find a job. So that's Andrew at speakupforblue.com. If you want to contact me, I'd be more than happy to help out. Until then, thank you very much for listening. Uh, join the Facebook group to ask any other questions, um, but if you want one-on-one -on -one help, you just have to ask me. I'll do a consultation over, over Zoom or Skype or whatever you prefer. And until next time, my name is Andrew Lewin. and you've been listening to the Speak Up For Blue podcast. Happy conservation. Have a great Friday. Have a great weekend. Good luck in your search for your passion and your dreams. And happy conservation.